Lucien's Quest for the 3DO. Now, it is one of the only good RPGs for the system because it is one of the only RPGs for the system, at least here in the US, and especially if you're thinking traditional JRPGs. Realistically, we only got two-ish Lucien's Quest and Guardian War, both of which were developed by the now defunct Micro Cabin. Now, Micro Cabin has a little bit of a track record in history, mostly, I think, a little bit more known in Japan for adventure games, RPGs, and the like. At some point, I would really like to do a developer showcase of this now defunct company, but for the time being, we're just sticking with Lucien's Quest. So both titles take advantage of the system's power by integrating 3D into their respective worlds. And during the 3DO's life, it was actually pretty common to see scaling 2D sprites within primitive 3D backgrounds. More on that in a moment when we talk about graphics and presentation. Either way, between the two of them, Lucien's Quest is much, much rarer. Guardian War really isn't even rare at all. I mean, it, it kind of ranges depending on condition anywhere from 15 to 35 dollars, whereas Lucien's Quest, I had been waiting for years and years and years to find a decent condition copy. Normally it starts at around 150 and goes up to around 300, again, depending on condition and whether or not you have the long box. Now, like many titles in the 3DO library, Lucien's Quest received a remake. Oftentimes you would see 3DO games, whether it be Gex or some of the shoot 'em ups, you know, make their way to the Saturn or the PlayStation or what have you. In this case, there was a Japanese only port for the Sega Saturn known as Sword and Sorcery. In fact, Lucien's Quest just in general in Japan was known as Sword and Sorcery. Now, I'm gonna be getting into that port a little bit. I'm mostly focusing on the 3DO version, but I will be talking about some of the differences toward the end of the video and ultimately which I think is the better game. Lucien's Quest was released in the golden age of sprawling RPGs. Complicated storylines, 60 plus hour quests, etc, etc, and Lucien's Quest has none of these things. Its story is short and simple to the point of parody. In fact, it rides some line somewhere between pastiche and parody. Like, it kind of toes this strange middle ground. So, here's the story itself. Ago is a warrior from a decimated village. His village was destroyed, and he himself was cursed by the Junin, which are a race of wolf beings. Ego, now a werewolf, seeks a magician's help in finding the cure. Unfortunately for him, the head sorcerer is gone, and he finds himself face to face with Lucien instead, the sorcerer's apprentice. Now, before the head sorcerer left, he told Lucien that a stranger would come seeking help, and she must aid him. But mostly, she's just bored, so she joins him. And that's kind of basically how the story goes. It really just pokes fun at the following RPG tropes. There's constantly random people joining your party and risking their lives with little to no motivation. When you enter troubled towns, suddenly all of the villagers just trust you. A complete stranger to solve all of their problems. In fact, in one village that I entered, there was little to no interaction. The first house I wandered into just happened to be the mayor's house, and he just immediately started giving me orders. It also parodies the big bad as being a threat. So the antagonist in this game they don't really seem afraid of. They don't really seem to care. I mean, maybe it's the name Dark Queen, Dark Shadow. They're terrible names, but they just don't really seem to care. Every boss, they're like, let's go get them. It's all very tongue in cheek with the main characters needing basically no motivation to act heroically. The dialogue is especially silly. The characters quip and they argue. They poke fun at each other for crushing on the protagonist, Lucien. <laughs> They think silly thoughts, they fart. Compared to other well-written RPGs, it's honestly pretty shallow. 
Now one qualm is that Lucienne seems to be a bit forgetful towards the end. In the beginning, she's just very fun-loving, and then toward the end, she kind of becomes dumb. Now, I've read a review that says in the Japanese version, she's more mischievous, and that the English translation made her a little bit more of an airhead, but even still, the English translation is inconsistent from the beginning to the end. It, it, it's a little bit off and, and feels like a mistake. I, I think I, regardless, would have preferred the Japanese translation, or the Japanese version where she's more mischievous. All in all, the quest only lasts about 15 hours or so, which is good. I feel like a silly little quest like this shouldn't overstay its welcome. However, this is also why it receives better reviews now than when it was initially released. Most contemporary reviewers simply saw it as too short and too silly. They probably had just played like an epic, like Final Fantasy VI, and then reviewed Lucien's quest and was like, what the hell is this? This game is actively pushing back against the status quo, and I think people saw that as sort of just, at the time, only doing a mediocre job of living up to the status quo instead of what it was actually trying to do. That said, you've probably noticed by now, the game is a combination of 2D sprites similar to the 16 and even 32-bit sprite era, plus primitive 3D in the background. It makes a game look interesting, to say the very least. I've seen titles apply this look before, but never quite like this, or at least never quite in this combination, which seemed to be, again, more prevalent on the 3DO. So this is a 32-bit system, but the 3DO was kind of pre the 32-bit era, if that makes sense. It was released before the heavy hitters like the PlayStation. It was really powerful for the time, but pretty inaccessible due to its price tag. So it was kind of like this playground of sorts for experimentation for developers. That said, during the PS1 era, I remember seeing more RPGs that had 3D characters with pre-rendered backgrounds, i.e. Final Fantasy VII, or 2D sprites with pre-rendered pseudo 3 looking or drawn backgrounds, i.e. like Star Ocean. I think the 2D on 3D uh, was of course done, but kind of more rarely. Uh, in RPGs, at least I don't, I didn't see it very often, like it's done in Lucien's Quest. And it is very, very primitive in this case. <laughs> to kind of drive the point home, I mean, remember, you know, if you ever played a 3D PlayStation game nowadays, and you think, good God, you know, this looks rough. You know, well, this is a pre-PlayStation console, so it looks even rougher than you remember, pl than PlayStation would look now to you. That said, the game kind of reminds me of the look of Octopath Traveler. When I posted some screenshots on Twitter, people were asking me if it was Octopath. And you can kind of see how it's similar. Obviously, Octopath is way, way, way more detailed, but it kind of has that vignetting effect where the outer edges are darkened and gets lighter as it goes uh, toward the center, and obviously vice versa, darker as it goes toward the exterior. Now, although the graphics are very, very, very early, there are a few bits here and there that did really stand out to me. Here you can see the game is playing with perspective. You are high up. It does not look great, but I appreciate what they are trying to do. Another aspect I love is the use of color. There are some very vibrant areas like this volcano where there's just a lot going on, or this area where the hue is inverted. As the game goes on, the visual style slowly gets crazier, and you can kind of feel the developers experimenting more. Which I definitely appreciated. There are also different camera options, including a regular, high speed, and more free roaming. Honestly, I would stick to the default. The other options are kind of interesting to play around with, but very difficult to play with, if that makes sense. It skews your perspective too much. Some of them, you can kind of get a better perspective of 3D and kind of almost get like a third person as the camera comes down as you move, but it's not possible to play long term like this. It does, though, drive home the fact that you are in a 3D world. 
In battle, the sprites are crisp, the magic looks vibrant, and honestly, the animations overall look great. I also particularly like how the landscape is uh, manipulatable. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, when you use magic like Earthquake or Earth Eater, it waves and it bubbles and it engulfs and it, it's kind of interesting what they were able to accomplish here. And speaking of the 2D sprites, there's also some pretty neat art here. I particularly like the character bios, although some of the characters are in fact very horrifying. The summons are also really cool. They're not really summons, like in a traditional Final Fantasy sense. They're basically items that even non-magic users can utilize to perform magic. Which is weird because they can't perform magic, but it still utilizes their MP. But the avatars for these summons are pretty badass. And I also like how they didn't bother to censor anything. You get full-on boobage here. In fact, some of the enemies have full-on boobage as well, but it is horrifying. Moving on to music, it is very hit or miss. Some tracks are good, some tracks I really enjoy, but there is a lot, lot, lot of repetition. And some of the choices were just odd, like this track, for instance. The music is not really the strong point here. It gets a 6 out of 10 in that department. Sound effects are serviceable, but nothing worth discussing further. Let's move on to gameplay. It's simple, but I like it. It's a JRPG. You level up, you buy new items, you upgrade equipment, etc, etc. Battle is pretty basic, but with one major wrinkle in the classic JRPG formula, you have obstacles. Literal, physical obstacles on the battlefield. These can either be battered down to reach an opponent, or you can hide characters behind them for your own defense. Enemies can do the same thing, however. You often need to strategize how to get to an enemy without wasting your turn attacking some tree or some rock. Many reviews I've read sort of downplay this obstacle mechanic. Some say that it is useless, some say that it's annoying or frustrating, but I feel like that these reviewers maybe didn't play the game through. Because as the game evolves, the strategy with these obstacles gets a little bit more nuanced, a little bit more intense. You can do more things with them. So for example, there's a character that has a throw option. He can pick up and attack enemies with those obstacles. This even works against enemies that are only vulnerable to magic, making it really useful, considering you only have really one true magic user in your party, and that's Lucienne. Another character leaps when attacking. You need to place him properly and know what obstacles will stop him and which ones he can leap over, depending on his distance from the obstacle. Now, these barriers and obstacles also appear in the normal game world. And depending on whether you destroy them in the game world, that affects whether they show up in the battle screen and vice versa. And the game actually really encourages you to break everything you possibly can, because there are often items that can be found. You break nearly everything. Trees, walls, those solid iron knobs that boats tie themselves to on docks. I don't know how you break that, but you can break a lot of crap in this game. Fireplaces, like walls. You just, I don't know. You just, giant pine trees, just butt up against it and you break it. There's a lot of unexpected randomness to destroy. Now, regarding your formation and characters within battles, only four can be in battle at once. But you can determine rows, allowing your lower health characters like Lucienne to hide behind the brutes and do her magic and healing uninterrupted. In this case, unless an enemy has like a long range weapon or like a spear or something, your characters in front of Lucienne or whoever you put in the back row will function as a shield. In the overworld, basic exploration is encouraged. There are a number of treasure chests in the off paths of dungeons, not to mention there is a magic user in most towns that will teach Lucienne new magic. The gameplay overall is pretty basic, but it's rewarding. 
There are also a number of little touches that I really, really appreciate, and these touches are as follows. First off, Lucienne has been studying magic for years. Her abilities are already leveled up. She can choose to pump more MP into an attack to make it stronger or less to make it weaker. Like I said earlier, she does gain new abilities from other magic users that she meets, but you never have to level those up. They're already leveled up if you want them to be, depending on how much MP you're willing to spend. Now within Lucien's skill set is a fast travel system, a teleportation option, which you have immediate access to. Anywhere you've been, regardless of whether you've completed the missions in that area, you can teleport back to. There is no need to backtrack along the world map if you don't feel like grinding, which is awesome. I feel like in many RPGs, you know, you get a teleportation system later on or an airship near the end game. Here, it's like, okay, I'm in a town. I want to go back to the first town. Boom. Not a big deal. No problem whatsoever. It's quick. It's simple. It's good. Here's another one. Characters level up regardless of whether they participate in battle. So there's no need to swap characters if you don't want to. So for example, Lucien can actually create a golem to fight the enemies or protect the party. If you swap it out, it levels up regardless. Actually, the, the golem creation is pretty awesome because you can utilize that before you have four members to your party. So if you have three members to your party, you can create a golem and fill that fourth slot prematurely, which is great. Along these lines, characters that aren't in battle are in a waiting position. So once a character falls in battle, they'll auto-swap with one of the ones that are lying in wait, which gives you a little extra leeway because you can die and just have characters replace themselves in the battle automatically. Remember how I said Ago is a werewolf? Well, there is also a day-night system, and he becomes stronger at night, as werewolves often do. And uh, you can utilize this to your advantage, because let's say you have a dungeon that's especially difficult. Well, on the world map, time passes. In the dungeon, it doesn't. So all you have to do is wait on the outside for it to turn to night. He becomes a werewolf, and you can do the entire dungeon as soon as you walk in. It's still nighttime in that dungeon. The entire time, you're a werewolf. Time doesn't pass by, and you have stat increases. It's nice. So these were just a few of the thoughtful touches. Uh, they make so much sense that I wish more games, at least in the era, would have implemented them. That said, although these features are excellent, the title has many, many missed opportunities. So, for example, you know, as we know, RPGs can be repetitive. They can be repetitive. So oftentimes, you know, RPGs will throw in little twists in the gameplay or little, um, you know, mini games, right? You know, in Zelda, you can go into the towns and play mini games. In Chrono Trigger, you have that drag race segment. You know, lots of games do this. They might like add a secondary way to travel, like an airship or a chocobo or something like that, just to give you a different feel for the mechanics and physics in the game. So in Lucien's quest, there's a point where your party rides a sand runner. Basically, it's a giant pig capable of crossing a desert that you otherwise cannot cross on foot. The animation of Lucien riding is super cute. The speed is thrilling, at least compared to the pace of the rest of the game. And frankly, it, it looks good and it's fun to explore. And you can explore, sort of. You can travel around a small area, but there's nothing really to do. The game just kind of wants you to go from point A to point B on this sand runner. It's a really fun little spark and change in the travel system. But I wish you could do it more than once. They, they did this whole new gameplay mechanic and just used it once. It would have been interesting if like maybe there was something to find on the Sand Runner, or maybe someone to race, or maybe you would fight other people on Sand Runners. I don't know, anything. But it was just felt so fun and such a wasted opportunity all at the same time. So if anything, what I'm trying to say is Lucien's quest lacks variety. The same goes for the dungeons. They're fine. Nothing crazy, very basic puzzles, basic obstacles, and for the most part, each dungeon has its own self-contained visual style. But the last dungeon, and there are going to be some visual spoilers here, no story spoilers, but the last dungeon adds much needed visual variety, as well as added depth and alternate paths. It feels like the developers were trying to step up their game, but at the last minute. It feels like every dungeon should have been the way the last dungeon was. Again, the other dungeons were fine, but they could have been better. My only other real complaint regarding the gameplay is the lack of enemy variety and the slow cycling of enemies. So you're stuck with the same enemies for a while, and then a new one is introduced, and then you get those for a while, plus the originals, and then an additional, and then slowly an additional, 
And even when you go to a new continent, you're still fighting a lot of the same enemies that you were fighting on the old continent. I would expect a total, complete revamp of the type of enemies that you're fighting, but you just don't get that. It cycles very slowly over time. You do get new enemies, but it becomes repetitive. Again, it's a lack of variety issue. So my overall thoughts. The gameplay is solid enough, the story is fun, and it's extremely unique looking. You know, the game is not gonna go down in the annals of history as having the greatest story or the best battle system, but it is a gem of a title that attempted to do something unique and somewhat succeeded. And for that, I think it deserves a seven out of 10, which doesn't sound great, but it's also a lot better than some of those early reviews. But before we finish up, let's compare it to the Saturn version. Now, I'm not gonna go into momentous detail on this port because ultimately it is the same game. If you didn't like Lucien's Quest, you're not going to magically like Sword and Sorcery. But I will be discussing the differences, which are primarily aesthetic. Now, right off the bat, we get an opening anime-style cutscene. Production quality is great here, and it's a very nice touch. The characters have been redesigned. Lucienne's a brunette for some reason, even though in-game she's still a blonde. I have no idea why they needed this adjustment, but apparently they did for some reason. Now, I didn't get far enough in this port to acquire additional characters, but here's Agos and Lucienne's character bios in the Saturn port compared to the 3DO. Speaking of which, we now get both voice acting and expressive faces during dialogue to sort of help flesh out the tone. Now, in battle, the magic effects are often different, and the perspective is different as well. So in the 3DO version, you kind of saw their backsides, and the Saturn port, you see just their side sides. It's nice, you get to see a little bit more of the character in battle. But the scaling seems really off here. Lucienne is supposed to be very small, but she's as big as Ago on the battle screen. It's weird. So again, there really should have been more graphical enhancements because the Saturn was certainly capable of doing it. Uh, even little things like the colors on the Saturn seem more muted and desaturated, which is an odd choice because Lucien's Quest or Sword and Sorcery is such a silly, fun story that you would want bright, vibrant colors. Again, I don't know if the desaturation was intentional or not, but it just seems like an odd choice. Also, the effects, at least in some cases, aren't as good on the Saturn. So on the 3DO version, on the world map, you have sort of transparent like clouds roaming by and sort of semi-transparent shadows on the landscape. In the Saturn version, you don't have that. So transparencies were possible on the Saturn, but they were very difficult to achieve. So in this case, the developers just said, screw it and completely skipped doing it. So in this particular aspect, the 3DO wins out, which is weird because we're talking about the 3DO. Overall, Sword and Sorcery, it's not a bad port, but I do think it is a very lazy port. If you enjoyed Lucien's Quest, you're still gonna enjoy this, but I do feel bad for anyone that picked this up back in the day on the Saturn in Japan, not knowing it was a 3DO title and just thinking it was a horribly done Saturn game. Now, granted, there are some things that they added to the title, like those anime cutscenes. Apparently the actress, the voice actress for Lucienne was a, a famous Japanese actress. So they sort of sprinkled in different selling points, but they did that in lieu of revamping and rebuilding the game from the ground up, which is kind of what they should have done. That said, as Americans, as English speakers, none of that probably matters because you're probably not gonna play this version anyways, unless you can find a patch for it and patch an ISO. Probably doesn't matter, but still worth mentioning. So that is Lucien's Quest and Sword and Sorcery. I hope that you all enjoyed this sort of longer style, more in-depth review. Again, a lot of people haven't heard of this title, haven't heard of Micro Cabin, so I wanted to pick up a little bit of the slack. Aside from that, again, I appreciate you all watching. Thank you to our subscribers, our Patreon supporters. Click that notification bell so you know when our videos are coming out, and we'll see you all next time. Take care. Never